All right, everyone, we will get started. And I know there's going to be some individuals who uh, might be still joining us, but um, thank you everyone for being a part of this breakout session. Um, we're very excited to do a deeper dive into the Instant Network School example and to really look at how partnerships can help um, sort of set the ground for connected education and have been pivotal in providing continuous education opportunities uh, for refugees and hosting communities um, during the COVID pandemic. We've got a great panel um, who are going to give you examples from both DRC and Tanzania um, to share a little bit about what their experiences have been. And we also have uh, individuals from Vodafone Foundation that are joining. And I see from some of our participants, we also have other uh, coaches and partners of the INS program. And so we do invite people to share their comments, um, to make reflections as we're going through the session um, and ask any questions that you have. And we'll make sure that we've got time for Q&A at the end. But let's get started. We'll dive right in. Um, hopefully everyone had a chance to catch the opening video um, that we showed uh, during the main plenary session that gave you a little bit of a snapshot about the Instant Network School program. But first I want to turn it over to Alban, who's our focal point from Vodafone Foundation today and is also the education coordinator on the program. Um, Alban, we know UNHCR and Vodafone Foundation have partnered for a long period of time on the Instant Network School program, I think going back uh, to 2013. And so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about what the INS is and the evolution over time. Over to you, Alban. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, yeah, so Vodafone Foundation is really committed to supporting the SDGs uh, and in particular goal four on uh, quality education for all. And we truly believe that every boy and girl should have access to quality education and that a technology can play a critical role in making this a reality. Um, and this is particularly true in ensuring that isolated and displaced communities are not left behind. So as you mentioned, since 2013, Vodafone Foundation and UNHCR collaborated on the Instant Network Schools program which uh, gives refugee and host communities, students and their teachers access to digital classroom um, infrastructure, therefore ensuring access to quality and relevant learning opportunities. So to deliver this program, uh, we, have, um, we take a holistic approach to improve learning outcomes rather than just learning about technology. So to do that for each partner schools, we provide them with power, uh, connectivity, hardware, uh, digital educational content, technical support and training. And we work alongside UNHCR and its education partners in the field to deliver this program. Uh, to date, we have deployed 36 uh, instant network schools across eight refugee camps. And the program has benefited over 80,000 students and more than 1,000 teachers. And last year in December at the Global Refugee Forum, Vodafone Foundation announced the expansion of the INS program with UNHCR to reach up to 300 schools by the end of 2025. So that means that uh, we will be able to reach over half a million refugee and host community students uh, and they will benefit from the program. And this year we'll start, so in 2020, we'll start by opening up 20 new schools in Egypt uh, and Mozambique. Wonderful, thank you so much, Elben. Um, I think that painted a really good picture of um, the roots of the program, but also the evolution of what we've seen to date. Um, now, we know that the focus of this conference and these virtual discussions are to do a bit more of a deep dive on COVID responses and how COVID has um, created some interruptions when it comes to education. 
And so I'd like to go first to Wendy, who is uh, joining us from DRC and is working with UNHCR. Wendy, we've all seen the dramatic uh, effects of the COVID pandemic, especially on education with a lot of school closures. Um, and we've seen that schools have been closed all around the world. And so how is this taking effect? What have you seen in DRC? Okay, thank you, Jackie, and uh, hello to the audience. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm speaking from the UNHCR office, sub-office of Badolite, that is in the equator region in the northern part of the country. Um, it hosts, uh, we host about 172,000 refugees from Central African Republic who are living in four camps and uh, out of camp settings. Now, I would just like to start by giving our audience a picture of how it is to live in the camps and what impact the dramatic school closure has had on the refugees and especially uh, the refugee children. Now, the refugee camps in general and the camps in the sub-office of, of Badolite are already a confined environment and space and the refugees do not have freedom to move around the way they would want to just like everybody else. Now, the households they live in um, are host about a minimum of about uh, five people and over. And this is already a very confined uh, space uh, for them. Now, for the refugee children, therefore, being uh, able to be out of this space on a daily basis in school, in a bigger and open space to interact with their peers and learn is usually a very great joy for them. Um, for UNHCR and its partners, the schools represent to us a space where we can keep the refugee children in, safe, um, in a safe place for most uh, part of the day on a daily basis, a space where we can keep them away from sexual and gender-based violence, a space where we can keep them off from idleness and getting into unsafe activities. And finally, a space where they can access to a fundamental human right to education and be at par with the other children in the rest of the globe. On a daily basis, the refugee children have access to the instant network schools, which we are partnering, partnering with, with Vodafone and we thank them for their support. And, um, these have been uh, set up and the refugee children are able to gain knowledge on information technology and drift themselves into a world of endless possibilities as a result. So I would like to say that the news about the school closure because of the pandemic was definitely met with a lot of disappointment, a lot of sadness, a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty, and lots of mixed feelings uh, for the refugee children and their parents. The safe space that they've known since they came to the camps is suddenly reduced to nothing. Uh, it's not available and the refugee children have to return to their world of inequality, no access to education. Much as we have solutions being seeked for those who are maybe in the bigger towns, it will be a long time before the refugee children may be able to access uh, opportunities to listen on radio or on TV because they don't even have televisions. Most of them in the camps don't have televisions and radio sets. So this is the kind of impact that the pandemic has caused in the refugee camps right here in the northern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you, Jackie. Wonderful, thank you, Wendy. Um, and that paints a very um, real picture of what the situation is like on the ground. And uh, for those that are joining us, we will get to expand a little bit more on what solutions, what opportunities have been presented uh, in DRC. But before we go there, I'd like to turn first um, to Arif, who is joining us from the International Rescue Committee um, based in Tanzania and also one of our partners supporting the Instant Network School Program, to tell us a little bit about the context in Tanzania. Um, what was it like, Arif, where schools were being closed um, on account of 
um, protection measures for COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Jackie. So um, in Tanzania, as in many other countries, schools have been closed uh, to respond to a, a COVID-19 pandemic. And so in here, the education ministries and other stakeholders have been working together to initiate uh, various programs that will enable children to uh, continue learning while at home. So in, uh, in the host communities and uh, at the national level, the Ministry of Education uh, makes uh, good use of the national radio and television to air and broadcast lessons for continuous learning, focusing especially with the exam, uh, with classes, with the examination classes. But in the refugee settings, um, also the uh, education working group, which is a group of organizations uh, implementing uh, education program in refugee contexts, have been pulling up uh, resources from partners as, uh, to establish program that will enable students to continue learning. So uh, um, paper-based uh, home learning packets have been used and, and have been suggested to be used. And there also the radio program where um, the immediate initiatives that um, at, at the moment at, at, at the final uh, stages of implementation. So um, for those who don't know, the uh, home learning packets uh, contains assignments and guide, uh, guidance notes, especially to guide parents to, uh, to assist, to support their children to learn at home. And there are resources that are designed uh, in a way that they will be uh, they will remain relevant even after COVID-19. The same way as the radio and interactive radio instructions will not only be helpful for the students to continue learning at their homes, but we are also in plan to uh, make uh, use of this uh, material after COVID to complement the resources that we already have at the INS program, as well as the resources that will be used to, uh, to complement textbooks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Arif. Um, I want to turn it now to Mwenga. And Mwenga is uh, representing the, the community, but also the INS coaches um, that have worked day to day in the schools uh, to be able to bring um, these programs to the community. And Mwenga, I wonder if you can give us a bit of a perspective on what it was like from the, the lens of the community as people were experiencing school closures um, and being um, sort of in the middle, in the thick of it. Wenga? Hello, Jackie. Great, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jackie. Yeah, it is true that uh, school closure in the refugee community is more than sending students at home. Uh, because the school in the place is the place where children are believed to, say, to be safe. And uh, we believe that uh, the schools are there to grow and acquire knowledge and skills to enable them to live decent life, including earning life. But now students are found in the streets, moving from one place to another, and the parents are unable to control the movement, something which has exposed them to sexual exploitation and abuse. Sometimes they, there is a lack of coping mechanism or events that spread of COVID-19. On the other hand, we have reality that Many children find themselves bored and for a long time they spend at home. So they miss even the activities which they were doing while they are at school grounds. Uh, actually, within the community, early teenage pregnancy and early marriage has increasingly been reported in their camp during the period of school closure. And uh, this is due to being exposed to, to hostile environments with no support mechanism to help protect from abuse because agencies working in the camps were not allowed to enter the camps. 
and many will uh, many children we believe that will be not able to return to school because of being uh, pregnant some are married and also some of them will be exposing to risk of contracting hiv aids which can push them not to go to school back Within the community, we believe that the children are unable to find books and that were available in the schools. Our children are also involved in household responsibilities, which make them time to study limitedly. So due to school closures, we believe that uh, some kids have been involved in two child labor, in two neighboring host communities, as this will be unable for them to continue the education once schools are reopened. So this is what in the community we are being observed during the, this period of school closures. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mwinga. I think again, painted a very clear picture of what the situation is like on the ground. Um, I'm gonna go back to Wendy for a moment. Uh, Wendy, uh, we touched on this a little bit that there's lots of measures that have been underway trying to look for solutions to ensure that continuous learning opportunities can make their way uh, to refugee communities amongst all of the challenges. And also looking at ways where we can ensure um, that everyone uh, as best as possible is able to continue supporting. And we know that in some contexts, the INS has played a role in this. So can you let us know a little bit more about what's happening within DRC and how you've been able to utilize some of the investments made pre-COVID to help with the continuous education responses? Okay, thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you to the audience again. First of all, uh, let me say that the Instant Network Schools, uh, before the shutdown, uh, served all the learners in the primary schools in the camps and they were able to access planned lessons at the centers on a weekly basis. Every day of the week, we have children from the refugee schools going into this uh, instant network schools to access uh, their learning material. The centers also served their teachers as a place they could research for teaching material for their students. Um, these centers also served the refugee youth and the host community youth to be able as a place to have access to online courses and universities and continue with their studies. Um, the centers finally also served a group of refugee adults uh, within the camp and out of camps uh, with a place in which they could easily get access to computer literacy skills. Uh, with the shutdown, uh, the access to the centers has not been business as usual for UNHCR and its partners. And uh, we've had to find really creative ways to utilize uh, the instant network schools to offer continuous learning to, the, to certain really priority groups because we were not able to continue the big groups of, of, of students going into the centers. Now, what did we do in the DRC? The first thing that uh, we've done with the instant network schools, we've left open their internet connection on a daily basis to certain priority students. Uh, these, for instance, are those that are in their candidate classes, the end of uh, primary school and also secondary school education. Now, what we do is, uh, we let we leave the internet open and the connection goes to about 50 meters uh, away 50 meters square away from the instant network schools and with their personal computers and their android phones for those who have the refugees are able to use the inter internet connection to access uh, their learning sites where they can download some of their revision material and uh, use this to revise from their homes. The internet connection uh, that we have uh, also serves a second group of priority people uh, who have been allowed to access uh, in a similar way this uh, connection that is left open. And these are the teachers in the camps. Uh, what they do is they are able to come uh, to the centers uh, and connect with their own computers and 
with this connection, they're able to download uh, teaching material and revision material. And with the education partner of UNHCR, they've established a program where these teachers are able to go uh, into the community in, to meet these uh, candidate students during the week and teach them from their homes. Um, another group of, 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 of priority uh, people that we've allowed to come and access the internet connection are those ones that were studying for their master's classes. We have a few of the refugees who are studying for their master's uh, classes so that they did not have to uh, lose uh, touch with their studies. We've also allowed them to come with their computers for those who have and access uh, the centers. Uh, lastly, we have uh, also allowed very special access to certain refugees who have their family members who are in other parts of the world where the, the pandemic has really hit and they really need to communicate with their family members. So they're able from time to time allowed to come uh, connect onto email and, and able to uh, speak with their family members on email and on social uh, networks, social media. Uh, we also allow them uh, to use the solar panel energy that we have at the centers to charge their phones, to charge their computers. And with these, they're able to, to keep this charge and use it from their homes uh, in the evenings when uh, the centers are closed. So that is the way we've tried to use the centers to serve the refugees during this uh, pandemic period. Thank you, Jackie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendy. And it's been great to hear how some of the different investments that have been made, um, even considering sort of the safety measures put in place for social distancing or physical distancing, you've been able to use those investments uh, to provide uh, both teachers the um, and resource bank so they can prepare for the lessons that they're doing uh, with students, but also for people to be able to continue their online studies. Um, I think that was very, very helpful and um, very promising to know how uh, when these resources are put in place, people uh, can, you know, be quite creative uh, with looking at how to adapt to the context. So let me go next to Arif. Arif, we know in Tanzania schools are already starting to open back up. Um, and in this uh, context, we know the Instant Network School Program as back to schools are being phased, some of the class sizes need to be smaller, uh, resources like the Instant Network School are being put uh, to use uh, to support catch-up programs and a whole uh, array of different programming. Um, can you shed some light a little bit more on what the plans are underway within Tanzania? Yeah, sure, Jack. Thank you again. So um, at the moment, we, uh, we, we have started to plan lessons with teachers, catch up and remedial lessons. Now, and we have started with higher secondary students who are also expected to sit for national examination soon. So at the same time, the, the, the radio programming is still continuing to, uh, is, uh, the teams are continuing to uh, pursue the radio, radio programming which will continue to supplement what the, uh, the children have missed during the school closure. So um, for, for the use of YNS, we have already prepared a guideline for the use of the centers so as to observe all the health protocols that have been put together by the health of, by the Minister of Health. And um, we are, despite the use of digital learning platform through the INA centers, we have plans to use radio program as I mentioned earlier, so, uh, so as to support the classes that will continue with the rest, uh, with the lessons after, after the schools are reopened. And also, um, maybe let me sh uh, try to shed some light for those who don't know what an, in an instant networking school is it's um it's um i think it has been mentioned by my uh, my fellow speaker albani elia but i will just uh, sh shine some light for those who have joined recently it's a classroom with uh, 50 tablets and power or this connectivity 
um, and there are also uh, a laptop and a projector which uh, the teachers can use to plan their lessons and project in the classrooms and students are allowed to come and access the uh, materials that are being prepared by their teacher. So in here we are, we are, we are, we are uh, going to use, we are planning to use also the lessons that the teachers have prepared uh, back in, and in the, those days and utilize those materials for catch up programs and reviews. But also we are planning to use the examination platform, which is uh, one of the, of the platform that we have at the INA centers where teachers can upload with the questions and uh, for, for the students to prepare for the, the examination. So all these materials and resources will, will, will enhance uh, self-studies for the students and provision of alternative options for teachers to facilitate their classes. So we are also looking forward to uh, make good use of free digital resources, which are um, available online, uh, including the links and, um, and distance uh, learning platform, which have been offered freely during this time of COVID-19. Excellent. Thank you, Arab. I think what's particularly interesting um, also, as you talked about radio instruction, uh, looking at how those radio instruction materials that have been made available that were actually originally designed for classrooms are being integrated into the local servers of the INS for use in the classrooms and in other environments. But also, just as you said, all of the great materials that the INS coaches and teachers have produced before will be pivotal to help students with remedial classes and um, helping them catch up and, and review materials that um, might be a little bit uh, forgotten or, or a bit removed having been out of school for so long. Um, but with that, let me go back to Moenga because Moenga, you have um, served as an INS coach uh, for a long time. Um, I think you were at, there at the start of the program within Tanzania and so you know how pivotal it is um, both to have teachers and INS coaches at the heart of the program. For you, as you think about back to school, what role do you imagine for the INS coaches helping with, um, as Arup said, some of these catch up programs and helping ensure that students are motivated to return back to school? Yeah, thank you, Yankee, for the time. Um, as you have said, that uh, really. I've been in the INS for a long time, and uh, we have uh, the different roles as we are playing as INS coach. Actually, I believe that uh, during this period, uh, students will be much happy coming back to schools, as I know that uh, they have they, they have missing the usage of INS classroom. As such, they will be motivated to see their colleagues as is subjecting themselves into COVID-19 the contracting risk. For that, as the principal that our INS coach are, are supposed to play during this period, and this may include to ensure that the protocol provided by the Ministry of Health are observed by both teachers and students. So in the first day back to school, I will orient students on the COVID-19, on the signs, how it spreads, and how to protect from contracting. And this may include protective measures as we have been trained. This should include creating awareness on COVID-19 so that uh, they can be also able to support their siblings, families, students, and teachers' well being, social emotional learning, psychological first age training, as well as referral mechanism in place in the case COVID 19 signs are identified and the steps to be taken. Also, I will make sure that all INS facilities are clean and safe to be used by learners and students, and teachers and students. On the other hand, I will support teachers to look or prepare for the additional resources online that will enable teachers to cover their topics smoothly. 
Also, learners will be supported to revisit the materials which have been created and uploaded on the server by teachers as part of safe studies. Also, coaches will, will be supporting teachers to upload questions on the examination platform for students who are expecting to sit for the national examination to prepare. That to say, from four students, um, grade eight students will supposed to sit for the national exam this year. Then we'll be supporting them at look at the questions uploaded on the platform. As a coach also, I will support to provide teachers with alternative options to use the INS classroom, especially during this time where students number in one class is very, very limited. So I think these are the roles that I will be playing as an INS coach during this post uh, COVID-19 period. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Moinga. Um, so I know we're very close uh, to time being finished, but as noted, we started a little bit late. So I'm gonna go for one last question to Alban and then we'll open up. We've seen some Q&A questions, particularly um, from individuals residing in other locations, also uh, looking at Malawi and wanting to know what programs, what services, um, and maybe even lessons learned we can take away from the context within DRC and Tanzania to ensure that in those contexts, individuals are able uh, to benefit as well. But first, Alban, let me come back to you uh, just to say, again, as we reflect on COVID-19, the pandemic, um, the measures that have been put in place that have created interruptions in school, but also uh, the creative solutions and ways that we've been able to find to utilize resources like the INS. Do you have any reflections on both the model of the INS, which has really focused on sort of a facility model, so based out of schools and community centers, but also where we need to go in the future um, when we look at connected education and the opportunities that programs like this bring? So Alban, over to you. Great, thank you, Jackie. Yes, I, I think with the COVID pandemic uh, leading to school closure in most countries, um, the INS program, but also all the school-based models have been largely affected and seen reduced activities during this period. Um, but we also heard from Wendy, for example, that we had numerous examples of how the INS continued to make a difference for refugee and host communities. Um, and Wendy mentions lots of, lots of examples and I think uh, other use cases around being able to access uh, timely and accurate information about the virus and protocols to help reduce its spread. Um, we've seen a, a clear role for the INS here and, and the use of the connectivity. Um, so this unique situation is challenging us, um, definitely, but it's also, I think, opening up new opportunities to straighten education programs on the long term. Um, and now that schools are slowly reopening and new initiatives are being put in place, like the one led by my colleagues in Tanzania and DRC, um, who I really want to thank for the fantastic job they have been doing every day to ensure access to the INS uh, while keeping everyone safe and following all the social distancing protocols. Um, without you, we, uh, we can't uh, achieve what we've been able to do so far. So thank you for that. Um, and I truly believe that the COVID crisis is a real catalyst uh, that accelerated the rollout of online and blended learning and has demonstrated how technology can be used uh, to straighten or to temporarily, temporarily substitute uh, to classroom instructions. Having said that, the in-school and remote learning approaches, I think, should be considered as complementary uh, to further support children and youth in their, journey, uh, in their learning journey. And to be successful, we need all the stakeholders to work together to ensure that all the elements are in place to support um, the students, the teachers, and the wider community. And in particular, I'm thinking about the local authorities um, who needs to put in place and 
the, the right regulation, the policies and the framework, um, and also think about uh, accompanying teachers with dedicated training and relevant skills development to make sure that they feel supported and they have what they need to adapt technology and drive usage. Um, because we know teachers are um, key in the process. Um, to be able to, to be successful, we also need to engage with digital educational content publishers and platform providers. Uh, access to content is similarly critical uh, and um, needed. Um, and finally, we need to engage with all the infrastructure partners, being the network operators for internet connectivity, uh, electricity companies for access to power, and then finally the device manufacturers to make sure um, we have a wide access to devices to be able to roll out um, those programs. And at the Vodafone Foundation, we are doing our best to leverage Vodafone company assets to distribute, to, to contribute to uh, connected education through the INS program. But we also are providing free access um, to online resources uh, via the Instant School program, for example. Um, and even more recently, so during the COVID emergency phase, we signed some deals with education uh, platforms such as Udemy and Perligo to provide free access during this period. Um, so to drive a positive change in the future, um, we really invite all interested parties to join us to support access to quality education and UNHCR's connected education uh, in particular. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alban. Um, so we do have some questions again that I did promise that we would go to. And I think, um, Alban, you made a nice segue um, to talk about the need for more partners, more investments, uh, really for collaboration. Um, I see there's a question that we had from Serge um, and one from Jacques as well saying, what about uh, individuals within the Zilika camp in Malawi? Um, education has been suspended on, um, on account of the pandemic. And is there any support for different organizations uh, for refugee education in Malawi? Um, so I'll, I'll take this one as uh, UNHCR's lead for connected education, just to say that we are working with a variety of partners. I know in Zilika, there's been investments uh, in the past that have been made by Microsoft and others to equip with the App Factory and other uh, connected education resources that were in conversations with the partners on the ground to see how best to leverage those contributions to ensure that we can um, make the steps uh, to leverage those resources and provide continuous education opportunities. Also looking, as we heard in the various panels, in complementing this um, with other low-tech resources, understanding that in some locations where we haven't had heavy investments in connected education in the past, it's really difficult to rapidly uh, scale up those contributions. And so this is why uh, we think it's really important and we've been using examples like we have from Tanzania and DRC to showcase what can happen when these resources are actually invested on early in um, so that when you do have interruptions in school, these can be leveraged to ensure that you can support continuous learning opportunities. But one thing we recognize as UNHCR is there needs to be a huge um, amount of more investments being made uh, to support connected education, to put in place strong connectivity infrastructures. Um, and as Alban articulately put, I think one of the things that we've noted uh, with COVID is really demonstrating how um, contributions can be um, how greater contributions can be made and how versatile connected education can be in these contexts. Um, so I'm seeing a couple more questions. We're told that we should invite people to put those in the Q&A. Um, just because of the number of participants we have, I don't think we can open up the mics, but I'm going to read the next question here. Um, that says, are there specific tech partners or partners in social enterprise who you know can avail of portable computer devices to refugee children um, and youth at a subsidized cost? And this is coming um, from our partners at Windle International Kenya. 
Um, maybe Alben, if you don't mind, I'm going to talk. I'm going to pass this to you because I know that Vodafone Foundation has also been engaged with a number of hardware partners trying to look at what can be accessible. And then I'm happy to share also more from the UNHCR side. Yes, thank you, Jackie, and thank you for the question. Um, so I think uh, we would be really happy to, to discuss the, the specifics and, and the projects um, behind. Um, and Vodafone Foundation, as Jackie mentioned, um, has in the past provided um, some um, smartphones or tablets, de depending on, on the needs, uh, identified to, to specific projects. So, uh, would be happy to you know take that offline and and have this discussion. Um, there are a number of um, enterprises um, involved um, in in the education space as well that offer um, uh, deals around hardware um, to be used for education purposes and for um, you know refugees in particular. So. Uh, very happy to to talk about the specifics as well offline and and to share some relevant contacts if if that's appropriate. Great, thanks, Alban. Um, one of the things that I'll say again from the UNHCR perspective is we've had a great number of partnerships um, with different private sector company, different social enterprises. Um, I think during COVID, the demands that were made for in-kind resources, as well as looking at um, having models that could be um, rated at, at cost or, or could be uh, provided um, in a, a rapid <laughs> means was actually um, there was a significant demand and this wasn't just coming from UNHCR and other UN partners, we were seeing this all around the world. Even within the US, I know there was huge requests uh, for resources to be provided. Where I'm from in Canada, we saw the same thing in Europe, the same. Uh, we also saw a lot of ministries as they were making provisions to loan equipment uh, to their citizens, also extending those offers uh, to refugees. But we know that, you know, always having in-kind resources won't be sustainable to meet the demands and so i think this is where we have to look at longer term development initiatives and investments to really equip schools and all schools um, with these resources so that we can make sure there's equitable access to education so i think there's definitely more work to be done um, and I think uh, what is wonderful about programs like the INS and so many of the other connected education programs is they show really what is possible um, when those investments are made and helping to make the case for further investments as well. So I see that there's one more question that we'll go to and then I do think we'll have to close it out. Um, just to say that there's a question here that relates to the question around Zalika but really touches on this issue about uh, learners who have been out of school for a while and might be facing different types of pressure in terms of the, the return to school, but also uh, engagement in um, other activities uh, that might be detrimental um, to them. And so how can we leverage and ensure that education um, and the opening back of schools and uh, catch up programs can actually incentivize the return to school? And so Mwenga, can I go first to you to again, kind of give this community perspective, um, but what do you think the value of initiatives like the INS are in terms of attracting students back to the classroom um, and helping to ensure um, healthy social behaviors? Yeah, thank you always more, Yaki, for the question. Uh, what I believe right now is that uh, the any centers are very, very useful in our refugee community. Uh, because uh, the centers are serving the wider community, not only uh, teachers and uh, students, but also to involve the community members. So I trust that our community members are benefit power to charge their devices, as we have a full of power. Uh, also, they use the INSU to communicate with the, their relative abroad in the country and they're searching for the information and learning free courses online. Uh, what I believe that uh, also in the INS schools, 
uh, in the schools where there are there are no libraries and laboratories, I think the NEC centers have been the useful tools for teachers to teach science subjects and practical lessons as well. So with the limit, the teachers get aligned and a student textbooks that we experience in the camp, the NEC centers have been able to supplement the gaps that our teachers and our students faced for the long time. Um, during this time of COVID-19 pandemic, I think the ENS classrooms are very, very more useful as they can play a big role for students and teachers on the catch-up programs. And uh, on the other end, I feel that uh, this is a great investment that uh, make changes to the life of refugees, which also need to be expanded to other centers so that uh, they, uh, they need refugees, children, and a youth can access and benefit from this wonderful investment that Vodafone has put in place for refugees, children, and a wider community, especially at the post-COVID-19 period. So I think this can be the, the eye that I can summarize when responding to your question. Thank you, Yaki. Wonderful, thank you, Moinga. Um, and yes, having supported these programs from a long period of time, it's interesting to see um, what are some of the pull factors and interesting factors. And I've talked to many parents who have reiterated that, you know, uh, knowing that their children are uh, building up their digital literacy skills and therefore having the ability to interact safely with the internet and communicate with others, um, they see as vital for opening up opportunities for them for their future. And I've heard it also from the, the students themselves um, that everything from knowing they can charge uh, their, their phones uh, to also being able to really engage online and be part of a, a broader community and be part of um, sort of the, the digital revolution that's going on is vital, not only at times of the, the pandemic of COVID, um, but also has sort of a, a lifeline to the outside world. Um, so thank you very much for that, Moinga. I know there's also an, a couple of other Q and A's, um, but I think we're over time. So we're going to have to close it out there. What I would like to say is I know from the participants joining, we have many people who are part of the INS um, in various different countries, be it South Sudan, Kenya, DRC, Tanzania, um, who are joining these discussions along with many other uh, colleagues and partners who are contributing to Connected Education. And I just really like to thank all of you um, for your efforts. We know uh, it's an uphill battle and there's a lot more that we need to do but all of you have played such an important role in showing what is possible. Um, and so hopefully in the years to come, we'll have more and more investments and we can continue to learn um, from the, the COVID responses and creative uses of tools like the INS. So again, let me say a huge thank you to Alban, Wendy, Moenga and Arup for sharing their perspectives, um, all much more articulate than myself uh, and did a great job of painting a picture of the realities on the ground. So a huge thank you to all of you and to everyone who's joining the conversation today. And just to say this isn't the end, it's a start. So please do send us any of the questions that you have, you can put them into the chat and we'll be happy to follow up uh, with you over email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye.